You may be you may be seated. The Apostle Paul, he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, he says, says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For the necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He, he makes that statement. Is, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. The gospel. The Apostle Paul was not merely saying that, uh, woe if he did not preach. But he specifies the message that he had to preach, and it was the gospel. And, and, and he was saying in that sense, is, if I do not preach the gospel, then I'm in bad shape. Because there's a lot of people that can preach. But if they're preaching something separate from the gospel, then they are in uh, uh, that, that, that risky place that the Apostle Paul warns about. And um, I have taught this church, and I have made reference to what we oftentimes call the fivefold ministry. It talks about that there are gifts to the church. There are apostles, and there are prophets, and there are um, uh, evangelists, and there are pastors, and there are teachers. And I have taught this church how, how um, what is not found in that list is preachers. You do not find preachers in that list, and I believe this, and I know this to be true, that the reason why you do not find preachers in that list is because everybody that has been saved has been called to be a preacher. Okay? I, I, I don't want that to bypass anybody, so I just, I'll just stay there for a second. Let me say it one more time. Everybody who has been saved has been called to be a preacher. I'm not talking about standing behind a pulpit necessarily, but you are one to be a messenger of the gospel. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul, he highlights what is the message that every preacher ought to preach, and it is the gospel. I'm not trying to be negative, but there are so many who can identify the gospel, but cannot preach the gospel. They're able to explain that it's a death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but what they've merely done is they've pinpointed or they have pointed towards the bullet points. I've heard it's become quite popular, uh, gospel singers. They say, uh, I speak Jesus into your situation. Anybody here, singers say, I speak Jesus into your situation? And, and, and what they're merely doing is, is they are just saying his name, but to speak Jesus is to reveal who he is. I'll use this example is, is if I were to introduce to you Brother Orlando, I walk up to you and I say, let me introduce you to Brother Orlando. And if that's all I did, I would just have merely pointed him out. I, I want this to make sense to somebody, but if, if when I introduce Brother Orlando, I tell you, Brother Orlando, he's somebody you can depend on. Brother Orlando, he's, he's faithful. He's, just, he's one of those that, you know, if he says he's going to do something, he does it. Uh, Brother Orlando is somebody who's for six years has faithfully been coming to the church and, and cleaning up the church for six years and, and, uh, and, and all that stuff. And not only that, Brother Orlando, his salsa is good. Brother Orlando can make good salsa. He knows his way around the kitchen. You know, because his family used to own a restaurant in Santa Rosa. Now, now, what did I do? I introduced you to Brother Orlando, and now you can build an opinion about him. Does that make sense to everybody? When you speak Jesus, you're just not saying his name, but you're testifying about him. You're starting to reveal who Jesus is, and, and by the end of that conversation, they, they should get to that point where they, they can come to that conclusion, you know, he's the one who can give me hope. He's the one who can change my situation. Hallelujah. To speak Jesus is more than to just point him out, but to share his goodness, his nature. 
so that people would want to come into the saving faith of who he is. Now, I come back to the gospel because in the same manner to preach, the gospel is not merely to quote the death, burial, and resurrection, not to say that is a gospel. Is this making sense to everybody? It's not merely to to say, well, the gospel means the good news. But the gospel is to bring someone to the point of revelation that there's so much goodness available. To whosoever wants to receive it. I preached to this church in August of last year. I don't expect everybody to remember. But August of, this, of last year, 2022, I preached our just cause. A just cause is more than a mission statement. A mission statement is something that, that you can set as a goal and you can reach. You can accomplish it. That's the whole goal of a mission statement. But a just cause is so far greater. It's, it's one of those things that you can dedicate your entire life for. You can live for it and you can die for it, but you're never going to achieve it because it's so far greater. I preach to this church that our just cause is that all could, could receive a personal experience with the gospel of Christ. Amen. You can live for that and you can die for that and, and, and you're still going to have a lot more to go for. Is this making sense to everybody? Our just cause is is not just our neighborhood. It's not even our city. But it's out of this church. People will be uh, messengers of the gospel if they head back home to whatever country they're from. So the gospel... 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2, it says it like this. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. There is no other gospel. There is no other message that can save people. And in, in, uh, um, the following verse, verse 3 says it this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. He died for our sins. In other words, the guilt that belonged to you, he died for those sins. And he was buried. And that he rose again in the third day according to Scripture. Hallelujah. I I know you've heard me say this before, but this is such a a beautiful message about the good news of the gospel. I've I've told you that Luke chapter 10, you see the parable of of the good Samaritan and and the gospel is so illuminated in that scripture. And it it comes out of 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 a, 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 a lawyer of that day asking Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Hallelujah. And in response to that question, it leads Jesus to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. It it, it lets us know that there was a certain man. He was leaving the city of Jerusalem. The, The city of Jerusalem, it signified a place chosen of God, blessed of God. It was a place with the righteous king. Hallelujah, a place of blessing, and and he was leaving Jerusalem, the fortified city, and he was heading down towards Jericho. I I know you've heard me say this before, but for those who have heard me, I want you to know it so well that you can just share it. Jericho was not like the blessed city of Jerusalem, but it was a city that had been destroyed. Not only that, it had been prophesied that if this city ever gets rebuilt, there is a curse upon Jericho. This city. And any time you leave where God wants you to be and you head away from it, you're going to a place of destruction. And the Bible lets us know that this certain man that that, um, as he left Jerusalem that he fell among thieves and, and the Bible says that they beat him savagely. And they left him half dead and they stripped him of his clothes. And in fact, they left him in a shameful situation. The, the, the Pharisees came by, the religious elite of that day, they came by. And they crossed on the other side of the street. They didn't want anything to do with that person. Because religion, if you don't have anything to offer religion, they usually don't want anything to do with you. 
And then the Levites, those who were responsible of ministering in the temple, the Bible lets us know that they went, he went out of curiosity. He saw it, he says, okay, what I have available cannot meet your needs, so I'm leaving you. And then that despised Samaritan, despised by the Gentiles and despised by the Jews, because he was half Gentile and he was half uh, Jew, the religious elite didn't want anything to have, have anything to do with him. And that good Samaritan, the picture of Christ, rejected by the religious of that day. Hallelujah. God and man. And the Bible says that he bandaged up his wounds. He, he put healing ointment upon him. He put him on his own donkey and he took him into the inn. And he talks to the innkeeper, which is the church. And he tells them, he says, you know what? Take care of him. And whatever he needs, I'm paying the price, but if there's anything extra you end up giving him, I will, I will pay you the difference. Hallelujah. But, but I want to bring your attention to that part that says that he was left half dead. I know, I know I've shared this with the church before. Because it's a curious statement. How can somebody be left half dead? Brother, Brother Noel, he's in the medical f profession, right? Anybody else in the medical field? But Brother, Brother Noel, when you go see a patient, I, I don't think you tell him it's like, okay, you're 70% healthy and 30% unhealthy. You don't tell him that. You're not using percentages. You don't tell them, okay, you're 50% whole and 50% dead. But this scripture says the man was left half dead. Hallelujah. This parable is talking about every single person other than Jesus. It's in the days of Adam and Eve. Every single person from that day is in that condition. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, And the Lord God placed a man in the garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, Ye may freely eat of the tree, fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. The Lord told him that when you eat of that tree, you're going to die. And our God's not a liar. He has never lied to anybody. But here's what the Bible says in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. It says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They didn't fall over dead. But the Bible says that their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Because that whole parable of, of that, 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 uh, that certain man that died or was left half dead, that's a, poor, that's a parable in the story of all humanity. Everybody in our world today is left like that certain man. They're born in, alive in the natural, but they are dead spiritually. Everybody you see walking the streets, they're in that condition. They, they can breathe God's air, but they have died. The moment that Eve and Adam ate of that fruit, they died spiritually. They, they died. You look at people and, and uh, um, people, they, they go to unending uh, ex uh, lengths to, 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 to find fulfillment. They, do, they will abandon themselves to pleasure, thinking, okay, this is going to fulfill that need in my life. Because that's a condition of all men. They're half dead. They, they will think, okay, this relationship is going to do it. Or this promotion is going to do it. Or this experience is going to do it. Or this drug is going to do it. Or this addiction is going to do it. Whatever it is. Is this making sense to everybody? Hallelujah. I'm talking to everybody because the good news of the gospel is that that good Samaritan, 
he found the one that was half dead. And he didn't leave him that way. Hallelujah. Here's what I'm telling everybody, and this is a message that every preacher in this place. You know, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to make some credentials. I think I'm going to make some credentials, and they're going to say, preacher, Brother Ray Robinson. Preacher, Sister Denise Williams. Preacher, Sister Hovita. I'm talking to everybody in this place. Because that message of the gospel, that you don't have to be half dead. You don't have to be uh, just looking for something to feel something that no experience can feel. Hallelujah. But I, again, I, this is just part of my uh, uh, introduction. I'm trying to get somewhere with this. And the second part, the curse of the fall of man is not just that he died. But there's a second part to that. One more minute. I need a... I need a Here it is. So the goodness of the gospel is more than man can have a complete life. You know, the Bible says that the, that the devil, he's the father of lies. He has mastered. He has a way of even speaking truth and adding a tone that creates doubt. Let, let me use this as an example. If I tell my wife, love, you are the love of my life. If I tell her, I love you, she understands what I'm saying. But if I were to say this, I love you, and that's what the devil does. He has a way of even speaking truth, but the tone in how he says it. And you see the devil in, in Genesis, he, he, he says this, Now the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts in the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He um, and the woman said unto the sermon, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil spoke truth right there. You're going to know good and evil. You're going to know good and evil. The day that you eat of that, you're going to know good and evil. It's the reality before man had fallen, man was in paradise. Man had no need for anything. They, they, uh, man had only experienced good. They weren't familiar with the idea of anything that was evil or bad. The, 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 the very concept of evil or bad was, was a foreign idea. They had nothing to compare it to. Genesis 3, 7 and 8 says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And the moment they ate of the tree, not only did they die spiritually, but all of evil and all of bad, like floodgates, entered into humanity. For the first time, they experienced shame. And they, and they sowed fig leaves. They didn't even know what they were allowing into humanity, but they experienced, they, they, they ushered into humanity a shame and, and rejection and envy and jealousy and disease and sickness and IRS and bills and stress. They unknowingly ushered in everything that was evil and bad. Hallelujah. I think I mentioned on Wednesday how, how shame is uh, the emotion of, of sin. You know, there, there's shame is the emotion of sin, and, and, um, and uh, you can, uh, you experience sin, and it doesn't leave you whole like when you started. 
Anybody knows what I'm talking about? And here's the good news of the gospel. Not only does it give you newness of life, but here's what Acts chapter 22, verse 16 says this. And now why tarry us thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All that evil had created, all the shame that was introduced into your life because of sin. There's some things that we wouldn't want others to know about. Things we've done in the... Right? And here's what the Bible, here's the thing, washing away. We've made mistakes. We have fallen. I'm talk, I know I'm, I'm, I'm not talking to people that have halos over their head yet. You have done things that, and here's the good news of the gospel. Not only does it give you newness of life, but every mistake can be washed away. He washes away shame. I, I've told this story, and, and uh, I, I, have, I, I have great parents. I, I, God bless me, and, and um, Friday will be a year that, since my dad passed. And um, the good dad, good mom, just, I, I was blessed. I, my mom's still alive. You know, and, and uh, you know, my mom, her, her testimony is, you know, grandpa was 45 and took advantage of somebody that was 15 or 16 years old. You know, that, those aren't good. That's not a good history to have. But he has a way of all that stuff of, you know, uh, being rejected of, of, of stepbrothers and all that stuff growing up as a, but God has a way of whatever happened of washing away those things. But here's what I feel because uh, the gospel is so good. And, and yesterday I was in prayer and I felt God speak to me that those who allow the gospel to do this work, and I would encourage you, I, I pray this all the time, Lord God, that the gospel would have its full effect in my life. You know, we can get all spruced up. We can get all cleaned up. But I felt the Lord speak to me yesterday how uh, we can get cleaned up. But you can have a dish on the kitchen table, and if it's empty, it could be clean. But it's meant for a purpose. That coffee cup is meant for a purpose. The Bible says that you are the temple of God. In other words, you're the house of God. And if all you do is try to get cleaned up without getting filled up, you have not met your purpose. There's a lot of people that are struggling in their walk with God. Not because you have not had an experience with the gospel, but you have had an experience and you stopped right there. I'm talking to me also. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein in an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The gospel is the, the, the new birth. When a child is born, there's a whole future that is born with it. There's potential and there's purpose. That, that baby is not meant to just be born and, and sit there. But there's a whole life that begins at that moment. Hallelujah. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it how I need to explain it today. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, says it like this, when an unclean spirit has gone out of man. We've been delivered from some awesome things. He walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Then he saith, I will return into my house where I was kicked out of. And from whence I came out. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. In other words, like, okay, I got kicked out of this house, but nobody has moved in. I had a family member call me a few months ago, and, and uh, he was wanting to invest in some real estate in California. And um, he says, I'll just buy it, and I'll leave it vacant. And when I go visit, I'll, I'll, go, uh, you know, I'll go live in there a few weeks out of the, the year. And I was like, don't do that. Not in California. You leave a house vacant, and somebody's going to move in. They're going to change the keys. They're going to destroy the house. And you're not going to be able to take possession even if you own it. 
And that, just like you see it in the natural, it happens in the spiritual. If you don't fill the house up, You go read, continue reading the following verse, Matthew 12 and verse 44, and it says that the later condition is worse. Here's what I'm preaching to the church today. That the gospel, your introduction to the gospel, that, that, that's the best news anybody will ever hear. But that is the beginning. That is the beginning of a new life. I was going to preach, um, I, I was starting to write some notes, and I was going to preach uh, a poor man's taste bud in a rich man's world. <laughs> That's what I was going to preach, and, and um, anyways, I'm not going to touch into it. But it, it does say in uh, the book of Mark chapter 8, verse 33, it says, But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savoreth not the things that be of God. In other words, Jesus was telling Peter, you have missed it. You have missed what it's all about. I'm preaching to me, okay? The gospel does not only keep you from hell. The promises of the gospel are not for a future date. They're not to be just experienced in eternity. The purpose of the gospel is not to be lived out in, in, in when we, we become glorified, but the, the purpose and promise of the gospel is, be, is be, to be lived out now. The, 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 what I'm preaching to this church today is we need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need to be filled. And it doesn't take long. You could have a conversation with somebody and, and what is in the inside is revealed. If there's greed on the inside, it only takes a few minute conversation with them. Am I talking the truth? If there's vanity on the inside, you know, what they're, you know what's in their heart just with a four minute conversation. If there's hurt on the inside, if there's a um, rebellion, if there's It has a way of revealing itself. And it's directly, what reveals itself is directly tied with the magnitude of the thing that's inside of them. If somebody has a little bit of greed, well, you'll see it pop up every once in a while. But if there's a big magnitude of it, you know, oh, this person will step on whoever they need to step on, rip anybody off in order to, you get what I'm talking about today. And here's what I'm talking to this church. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, there ought to be evidence in how you live your life. I'm not talking about just taking a little sip, because that's not what the commandment of the Bible is. It's not talking about just, uh, you know, having a little taste of it, but the Bible instructs us to be filled When you're filled with the evidence, is, uh, it's evidence in your conversation. It's evidence in your thoughts. It's evidence in your goals. It's evidence in your priorities. When you're filled, it doesn't, it doesn't have no, no, no uh, manner of being concealed because it's going to come out of you. And as pastor, I preach to this church unapologetically that every single one of us need to be so full of the Holy Ghost that we are sold out to Christ. Without hesitation, I, I tell you that the number one priority, I, I tell you, I, 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 unapologetically, unreservedly, the number one priority ought to be Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It ought to occupy your purpose. It ought to occupy your purpose. Hallelujah. So my question to this church, what is the evidence that you're full of the Holy Ghost? What is the evidence? I, I, I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll remember about Jesus on Sundays. 
but not on Tuesdays, not on Wednesday. Well, maybe Wednesdays, if, if it's not too cold out, I'll remember him. If, if uh, when you're so full of him, it's going to bleed out. 